<laughs> There's no avoiding it, Britta. Just deal with it. Got it. We Noted. Have, we have to have clean towels. <laughs> it's true. It's every Sunday with Beth and Britta. Are you guys ready for it? I don't think we're ready for it. We're clearly not prepared because we we don't know how to start this. So I guess I'll just start by saying this is Britta. And this is Beth. And we sound very similar and we apologize for that. But unless I really modulate my voice down and start to sound on like the level of like um, Kathleen Turner in the studio getting auto-tuned, which I can't <laughs> sustain for a whole episode... <laughs> We're we're gonna sound alike, so I apologize. I think you'll eventually get used to us. But anyway, this is the Lake Erie Library. We're here to talk about spoopy things with you. All things uh, supernatural and true crime, and you know we both work at a library, so we're also here to talk about spooky movies and spooky books we enjoy too. Yeah, you know. Research is part of our job, so we're hoping that we're doing a little bit deeper dive that maybe you don't want to do on your own. Save you a little bit of research time while you're driving, while you're doing laundry. Do you see how I brought it back to the laundry bath? So uh, you can just you can listen to the stories. We'll just we'll do the hard work. You just sit back and enjoy. So welcome to the Lake Erie Library. Take a seat and have a good listen with us. So today. We've got uh, two separate spooky locations to tell you about. We're starting with the Queen City. So today we're going to discuss first Cincinnati Music Hall, which I have researched this place multiple times. And upon researching it, because I just enjoy apparently having a dark sense of humor with the macabre, it makes me laugh every time because (laughs) I'm still dumbfounded that they're like, yeah, this place is haunted. It was also on Ghost Hunters, which I was like, Britta's going to just die for this because we just love uh, Zach from Ghost Hunters. Love is the kind word that she's using on this podcast because we don't want to get, you know, the Zach fans leaving mean comments. Be nice to us. We're sensitive. I cry over everything. I'm a mom, so I'm trying to have, like, a thicker skin, but, yeah, I'm a bit of a baby, too, on the internet, so just please be kind. So, I actually, I'm excited because uh, while Beth and I are co-workers as well as podcast co-hosts, I uh, have always been working the same shift as her when she gets to talk about spooky things um, at our location, and so I don't often get to hear the the cool stories that she tells so i don't know much about the cincinnati music hall are you ready let me tell you a thing okay i'm ready so is this the most haunted location in cincinnati the travel channel says yes i would say i don't know i can't be the judge of that I'll, i'll be honest with you I'm not, like, a spooky location goer. Like, if somebody's like, hey, you want to go spend the night at Mansfield Reformatory? I'd be like, no. No, thank you. I do. I I almost did yesterday because uh, I ran a race there, and I had a very hard time walking to my car afterwards. (laughs) I thought that that was just my home in the grass outside of the Mansfield Reformatory where I enjoyed a delicious blue otter pop. Thank you, Shawshank Hustle race organizers if you randomly find this first episode of a podcast that isn't about the Mansfield Reformatory thank you for that delicious popsicle please do it again next year (laughs) so um talking about Cincinnati Music Hall first of all I just want to say it is located on 1241 Elm Street and I just feel like if you've seen any Nightmare on Elm Street movies we should already be a little aware that this is not a good start. We're up to no good already. Yeah. If this were um, like any horror movie made in the last like 10 years, this is where like a giant title card would like slap the date on it on the picture of the music hall just to emphasize that, you know, like it's Elm Street. It's bad news. Red flags. So it's home to, you know, this is it's a like 
renowned music hall. It's home to the Cincinnati Ballet, the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, the Cincinnati Opera, the May Festival Chorus, and the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra. So, like, you know, also competing with the other C, uh, with Cleveland, with their orchestras and stuff. Like, it, it's, like, not a slouch of a building. It's beautiful. Uh, it's a national historic landmark since January 1975. It's well renowned for its architecture, and it opened on May 14th, 1878, after two years of construction. So it's a giant building. It's got multiple parts to the building, and it has a lot of good history associated with it, but it's also got a lot of spooky history associated with it. So we're going to back up before 1978. We're going to backtrack. We're going to go back to 1818, where the city of Cincinnati bought the land from Jesse Embry for $3,200. Must be nice. $3,200. What year is this again? 1818. Do you know the equivalent of that today? No, but I'm sure it's millions of dollars. Yeah, I don't... I'm not a math person, but that's... If I would still be like, wow, that's... um, I would take that amount of money right now. I feel like it has to be a lot. (laughs) Yes, that would be a lot. They're making pennies on the dollar back in 1818. So anyways, in January of 1821, the state legislature passed an act for a commercial hospital and lunatic asylum for the state of Ohio. We were like, Beth, why am I telling you this? Well, let me tell you. Ohio then created and constructed its first insane asylum in this location. Great. Uh, I hate saying insane asylum because I do feel like that is obviously not like politically correct to say, but that's what they called them in the 1800s because they didn't have the same uh, words and definitions for things that we do today. But obviously, with a name like that, you can imagine how people were treated. Yeah. Yes. Again, title card slammed right here with redacted. We're not going to call it that because we're more emotionally sensitive. Well, I have to call it that because it was called the Commercial Hospital and Lunatic Asylum of Ohio was the parent institution. So they had not only that, that was like the main building, but they also had the Orphan Asylum, the City Infirmary, the Cincinnati Hospital and the Longview Asylum. Uh, the hospital was the main facility. Uh, it housed also World War II. World War II, my God. The Civil War. <laughs> We're time traveling We're now. time traveling. Uh, it hosted uh, World War... Oh, my God. I did it again. Um, it hosted Civil War soldiers, so a lot of people died there. But then in 1832, so, you know, about... Uh, 10 years or so after it was built, there was a cholera outbreak in Cincinnati. A lot of people died. And following the massive outbreak, the land that the hospital was on was also used as a potter's field or pauper's grave. For those of you who don't know what that is, that is for people who don't have money, where they kind of just bury poor people in mass and unmarked graves. It happens, well, not today, but previously throughout history, it has happened a lot during outbreaks like this because people are dying so quickly that you just cannot inter them with full funeral rates as fast as people would like. Um, I used to live in Philadelphia. The majority of the public squares in Philadelphia, which are now public parks or city hall, were all... Potter's Fields, they were all built on these mass graves. So that's really funny because this is going to come up again later in this podcast episode. Sure. So for over 20 years, people were just buried there until 1857 when it was deemed unsuitable. Nearby property owners had serious complaints about the land use, particularly the pest house, which was then relocated outside the city. So they decided to kind of pack up and move. The land was not being used for that anymore but we're going to do as a small aside also (laughs) one of the reasons why the potter's field was so populated was not just the cholera outbreak but also six years later there was a canal that was cut through a part of the field and soil and they found a hundred skeletons and they removed them and then relocated them to an another overcrowded place of nameless graves 
but another source of remains came in the field from a disaster in 1838 when the steamer or steamship uh, Moselle exploded. So picture this, 1838, you have a steamship. It's got between 250 to 300 passengers going from like Cincinnati to Missouri. The boilers explode and it causes body parts and bodies to rain over the city of Cincinnati. That was the worst Sophia Golden Girls like <laughs> story I've ever heard. I I got so excited when you started with picture this, picture this. and then it ended in like r- raining body parts. Cincinnati, eighteen thirty eight. Um, <laughs> yikes! I just can't imagine being like a Joe Schmo, you know, working in the city and then like having an arm or a hand or even like a toe fall on my head. That's horrifying. Yeah, like you're just you're just going to Starbucks on the corner to get your coffee, get your twelve pump mocha kappa frappa. I don't know. I don't drink the really sugary ones. But I mean, you just mind your own business and then just like a leg is just like <laughs> right in your head. It's gone. That's awful. That's awful. It is awful. Obviously, dark humor, trying to laugh is a coping, but I cannot imagine it. Anyways, 150 people died from this explosion, and because they had a hard time identifying the bodies, they buried the remains that they could find in this potter's field. So what I'm trying to tell you is we have a lot of bodies, and we have a lot of people that were not put to rest in a nice way mostly because there were kind of bigger elements out of like the city's control but i don't have an excuse for it that that's just that's the circumstances that we're dealing with um anyhow so after 1857 the land was sitting uh vacant for a little while so then the music hall was able to buy it and they began excavating right away and when they did human remains were found And while they removed some of the bodies, they didn't remove all of the bodies. Thus, Cincinnati Music Hall is haunted with a capital H. So when the music hall was being built and the ground was excavated for an elevator, uh, more than a barrel full of skulls and bones were removed and then placed under the floor of another portion of the building. We got a real poltergeist situation going here. I also, like, a barrel full. A barrel full. I, this is a very, like, vast amount of things that this could be, because barrels are not, are barrels one size? Is that like a, is it like a peck and then a barrel? Or, because I'm just thinking, like, I need more information on the size of this barrel. I would imagine barrels were probably pretty standard back then like you had the phrase bottom of a barrel come from like that era because they didn't have preservatives in their food so if you got food from the bottom of the barrel chances are you were going to get sick from that food because it was moldy and bacteria filled got it i don't know why i am fixating on this i feel like any amount of like body parts without a body attached to it is bad it's probably it too doesn't many body really parts. matter how big the barrel is this is this is a moot point so so yes they they found body parts they removed them but then they reburied them on site somewhere else and a night watchman of the construction noted the weirdest and strangest noises would occur at all at intervals all night. Wrappings on the ceiling, under the floor, on the doors and windows, the sound of stealthy footfalls behind me or loud tramping before me, the crash of heavy timbers thrown from the ceiling, of glass dashed upon the floor, of heavy bodies being dragged over the planking. These never ceased. He also said, they never touch me, but I always know when they are around by an icy chill, a thrill of electricity as of electricity, a feeling like what the French call uh, peau de pole, or goose flesh. Apologize for my bastardization of French, obviously, because I took Spanish in high school. I always remember that pole means, well, I thought it meant chicken, but I guess chicken and goose might be interchangeable. I mean, like in sign language, it's one word for like bird, but uh, I always remember that pole means chicken because of the Disney 
movie for the Tower of Terror oh. when she's like, I'm Claire Poulet. It's French. And then later she's like, it means chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Disney. <laughs> they never annoy me now by mere knocking and rapping for I've got used to it. So used to it that sometimes when people have really knocked at the door, it didn't open because I thought it was only the dead that kept knocking, knocking, knocking. Sounds like a very fastidious night watchman. <laughs> I just, if I I would take a night watchman job because it sounds like it would be like ideal. You don't have to talk to anyone. It probably just leaves you alone. I mean, yes, it's a little spoopy, but like this, I would be so annoyed if it was just like glass breaking and knocking and like. You're not even going to show yourself to me, really. You're just, I can feel you watching me. This is, just go work in retail. It's the same thing. (laughs) And then you have, like, a normal sleep schedule. Uh, He also reported something that sounded like a man marching and dragging a musket across the floor. They did have a medium who came in and reported to see that as well. They assumed that it was a... Civil War soldier, which obviously makes sense since they had a hospital there that took care of soldiers. So <laughs> they also had in infer- they had further remodeling. So you know it's a building that was built in the 1800s. So 50 years later, in 1927, further remodeling uncovered three coffins, which were then reburied in the basement. Then in the same year, another expansion uncovered 65 graves. <laughs> so many 65 65 how do you just not know that there are 65 graves there until you're like hmm, let's put another rec room on here and dig out oh there's a lot of coffins i mean i guess i'm just glad that they had you know coffins and stuff like that as opposed to like a barrel full of bones just, like a really weird twist on the cask of a Montalado. it's just like a there's several barrels buried in this basement. Do they have wine <laughs> or are they full of phalanges? You won't know until you open it. Barrel of mystery. Oh, God. So after they found the 65 graves, that side of the music hall was earned the nickname the Valley of Death. <laughs> that is dramatic. <laughs> that is That feels like um, like a little too much emphasis on it. You know, I just feel like they took some creative licensing, but at the same time, like that's how many times did I say that they've done construction and then they found more remains and then they rebury them? At what point, if you keep doing construction and you keep finding bodies, at what point do you just come to expect it? Like, at what point do you hire someone whose job is like, all right, that's Brad the barrel guy. Wheel it over here. We got some more people that we have to go bury respectfully somewhere else. They rebury- So when I say they rebury it, they rebury it on site. I don't know how well they, I don't know how, I hope, I hope that they do it respectfully and mark, demark it somehow that like, hey, people are buried here. But I don't know because the first time they did it, they reburied them in the basement. So like how how yeah. gentle is that? This just feels like it feels like there's an analogy in there somewhere for like for a metaphor. I don't know. One of those for like the the implications and the the what happens when capitalism takes over and progress and we don't take care of things. It's like, well, we're just going to make more poltergeist activity by constantly just like throwing bones around. No big deal. It just wait. Capitalism does get its say at the end. Um, Great. Yay. Capitalism. Yay. Capitalism. So then in 1988, another elevator shaft uncovered 207 pounds of bones encased in concrete. Um, so they were rebuilding an elevator shaft and they found 207 pounds. At first, when I first read that, I said, oh, 207 bones. So like one skeleton. And then oh. I reread it and I went, pounds and bones are not the same words. Beth. No, like your bones. I mean, aside from your skull, your bones don't weigh very much. So, well, they're also encased in concrete. So that would 
That's fair. That would be pretty uh, hefty. But anyways, those at least, those went to the University of Cincinnati for anthropological study. So I, I do hope those were treated nicely. Those are all the bones that they have found that I, I found. I mean, if they've remodeled again, they may have found more. Um, but many longtime employees can testify to the hauntings of the music hall. There are other employees who are like, I've worked there 25 years. I've literally never had anything happen to me. To which I say, do you work the day shift? Do you, I don't know, not believe in that stuff? I don't know. I can't explain that. But the Pops late music director, Eric Kunzel, believed that they were basically friendly. And he said, there are def- they are definitely in this building some sort of spirits. If anybody thinks I'm nuts, come here at 3 in the morning or 4 in the morning. So it sounds like, especially for these creative types, they are staying there pretty late. And um, that's when they've noticed stuff. Uh, they apparently have seen like a woman dressed in period garb roaming like the lobby area of the music hall. There was a little boy of uh, one of the employees who was like, "Daddy, who's that in the like box?" And he's like, "There's nobody there." And he's like, "No, there's a man in the box." And so, like, they've had ghost sightings like that of like people coming like to visit. One ticket worker was sitting like at the booth and somebody kept like ringing like the bell as if they wanted a ticket so they did that multiple times and they're like nobody's here why where are they and then they saw a little ghost boy dressed in period garb okay i was so angry until you told me it was a child and now i'm forgiving (laughs) i was like oh what a rude rude person to even like in death be treating service workers as just like trash <laughs> like hello hello where's my ticket and then you're like it's a kid i was like it's oh kid. yeah. kids don't know any better they're they, just like it's a fun noise yeah um cincinnati music hall has been on travel channels most haunted places in america and to this day uh, to this day literally like i was looking through articles 2020 had an article 2021 had an article 2022 had an article usually posted around october and they're like why is the music hall so haunted in cincinnati i have no idea and i'm like do you do you though as they just like wheel another like eight barrels with like feet sticking out of them they're like we have no idea why it's so haunted and then as i said You know, most places, like, if you were to go, I don't know, to any other place that was, like, if you were to go visit, I'm trying to think of, like, the equivalent place, like, certain theaters and stuff, they don't want to admit to that, right? Like, you're there for the theater. You're there to enjoy a show. You don't want to talk about how spooky it is. So Cincinnati Music Hall, they have the friends, they have, like, a friends group, and they're like, oh, no, it's definitely haunted. For $40, yeah. you, too, can go on a ghost tour that's sanctioned by uh, the hall. So, you know. Capitalism. Capitalism. <laughs> so why not capitalize on, like, I mean, the fact that you're haunted? It's It beats, like, having to plan, like, a huge, like, fundraiser for, like, historical landmarks every year. Like, oh, no, we have to plan our gala or we're not going to be able to have the funding for next like. Oh charge $40 a pop for a ghost tour and we got it covered right you can do you you do what like two rounds of tours in a night and you're pretty much covered so they also have found all the employees that have like worked there like in the 90s and 2000s and stuff have all reported that you know we say it's poltergeist like activity but they are like no they're pretty friendly so I guess that's good like you know it's not malicious spirits they're just unrested spirits there are i guess worse places to be like stuck forever if you by no fault of your own are stuck haunting somewhere like at least you get to listen to like nice music i guess and ballet you get to watch like ballet that's cool that feels kind of rude though if there's like people who don't because their limbs are not buried with them (laughs) And then they have to watch dancers, like, dancing beautifully. And it's like, great, I'm just a torso over here. I don't know which barrel my legs are in. My foot got buried somewhere else today. That is like a country song right in itself. (laughs) In 2016, a photographer, a local photographer. A a photographer? A foot 
photographer. Um, they actually captured a dark mist like anomaly on camera. So they're saying there is somewhat physical evidence of it being haunted. So as I said, we got a real poltergeist situation here. I'm referencing poltergeist the movie because if you haven't seen poltergeist, which you should, OG movie, fantastic. The one with Sam Rockwell is not terrible, but like if you're going to watch one, watch the original one. The one with Coach. Yes, the one with Coach. Yeah. You know, the whole... the, The lady from the... It's the scariest place on earth or whatever it was called. Yeah. Love and she's in love potion number nine. I yeah. don't remember her name. This I house bad. is clean. Sweet, sweet woman. Uh, Very recognizable voice. So they um as I say in poltergeist, you removed the headstones, but you didn't remove the bodies. And you know, that was for like Native American land that they and like a pioneer cemetery that they d- did that to to develop housing. So kind of same thing. We're exploiting poor people here to create nicer things. Um, But at the same time, I guess they're sort of honoring their dead people by having ghost tours. Maybe. Or are they just exploiting them even more? (laughs) You can't give consent as a ghost. No, you can't. (laughs) You're just there in your afterlife. And people are still charging money. At your expense. That's true. That's true. Uh, Rude. (laughs) So I'll end on this note. Nevertheless, we occasionally hear some of hear of some uncanny places, even in practical pork packing Cincinnati, where the dead render the lives of the living a burden to them. Which that's coming from uh, the Cincinnati commercial in 1875. That was a quote from them. So I'll end it on that. But. Yeah, it's an interesting place to start with because it's very haunted. Just setting the bar real high for us, but sorry. <laughs> Higher or probably lower, I don't know. It's hard to tell. All right. Uh so also in Cincinnati and as Beth mentioned earlier, uh in the eighteen thirties and eighteen forties there was a recurrence of cholera and there were a lot of people dying very quickly and they had lots of bodies in these very small church cemeteries being interred very quickly and it was not a good look according to some of the <laughs> more uh, wealthy um, Cincinnatians they didn't like that it was like oh well, you have four funerals happening at once in this one churchyard and all of the ground is dug up because we're burying everyone. This is kind of a problem. No one wants to look at this. It's not comforting. <laughs> I'm so sorry that you're like, we've had like five people die of cholera, Barbara. Like, oh my God, can you just stop dying for like one day? Because like, I don't want to look at any more dirt piles while I'm burying my grandpa, okay? Like, that's what it feels like. So... <laughs> As a result of this, um, members of the Cincinnati Horticultural Society formed a cemetery association in 1844 with the goal of finding a location that was suitable for creating, as they put it, a picturesque park-like institution, a rural cemetery, and it was close enough to the city yet remote enough to not be disturbed by expansion. So essentially, we need a big enough plot of land to start burying people in bigger than these small churchyards but not anything that is going to inhibit Cincinnati growing as a city because we don't want to have to build the city around it god forbid and so this is how they came to create what is now known as Spring Grove Cemetery so they uh on this little society cemetery association they had men who were traveling around sort of studying other cemeteries. They wanted the land to be also big enough that they could use it for funerary purposes well into the future. Like, it's a one-stop shop. We're going to buy it once. We don't want to have to do this again. And they also wanted to plant, like, flowers and trees, which is why the Horticultural Society is involved in this, so that it would be a pretty place to also go and visit your loved ones. And they traveled across the U.S. and Europe visiting cemeteries that were sort of, like, known for being beautiful. 
and they uh, were very heavily influenced by Père Lachaise. And Paris, do you know this I, one? I don't know that it's cemetery. It's one of the more famous ones in Paris. It's where like Oscar Wilde and Jim oh, Morrison are, okay, okay. amongst many, many other people. But those are the two that like I know off the top of my head. As soon as you said Jim Morrison, I'm like, ah, yes, okay, I have heard of that cemetery. Yeah. Again, my French is not there because I didn't take French. Um, <laughs> so it all looks the same to me. And I probably sound like a very ignorant American, but I apologize. If it was Spanish, I'd be like, right up my alley. I can read that and probably pronounce it. Yeah, so they, they were very influenced by sort of like the renowned beauty of that cemetery in Paris and the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which I have no reference to. I've never been there, but it's in my notes. So on December 1st, 1844, I'm going to say this is Salmon Chase. It is spelled like salmon, so I want to pronounce it that way. But in my head, I'm hearing Salmon Rushdie. And so I think his name is Salmon Chase. I'm sorry, you can correct me gently if I'm pronouncing this wrong, and you know that. The rest of the group prepared the Articles of Incorporation. Um, they lobbied with legislators, persuading them to grant a charter for a nonprofit, non denominational corporation. This is all from the Grove Cemetery website, by the way, so these are quotes. Um, and they were granted this on January 21st of 1845. They had a consecration ceremony, and it was really like more of a celebration than you would think for something that is a cemetery they just were like very happy that they were able to make this happen well you know otherwise they were burying people in churchyards and you had the karens of the era getting upset that there's too many dead bodies right and then they had to stick them in barrels and roll them away <laughs> yeah so the first interment was made september 1st of 1845 and interestingly they were the first people buried there, but they are not in that cemetery anymore. Oh. Um, oh. So back in the day, if you had a lot of uh, spending money and you moved, you could like dig up your family members and move them with you and then reinter them. And so it was, um, there were two sisters that were buried there. And when their family moved to Wisconsin, they actually took them with them. So they are buried in Wisconsin now, okay. even though they were the first people to be interred in Spring Grove Cemetery. That's weird that you it's can do that. right? And it's interesting. Spooky movies don't cover that. That's the first I've heard of like, yeah, you can move for a small fee. You too can move your family and take them with you. Isn't that in one of the National Lampoon movies? Don't they? Doesn't she die on the roof? They like strap the ant to the roof or something. <laughs> Do you remember oh, wait, this? Wait. <laughs> They're like traveling across the country with her and then she dies. Yes, I think. Mean. <laughs> oh, like that's the closest thing I could think of. And it's not very nice. Like no. what they're doing is very kind. Like you yes. can still visit them, but that's. And it's probably like proper. Like they're, you know, being taken by a hearse or like, you know, however. Like well, yeah, 18, horse so and probably buggy. like horse on a, and buggy, or like a a train and like a cold car or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, in eighteen in nineteen eighty seven, Spring Grove officially changed its name to the Spring Grove Cemetery and Arboretum to include the expansive collection of both native and exotic plant materials, as well as its state and national champion trees and its centenarian collection centenarian what is that what is 100 thank you you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> not the math person here so they actually if you go on their website they have like a whole page that's just dedicated to all of the different types of trees that are grown there and they will tell you like what sections of the cemetery you can find these types there of trees there are a in. lot of different like bio nerds in the world you got your bird people which neither of us are those you got, you know, you got your dog people, you got your, you got your plant people, but then you got your tree people, which are slightly different than your plant people. Um, I'm pointing at that <laughs> right now. <laughs> I, I do like looking at trees and I like going, Ooh, is that an oak? Is that a maple? Um, but I'm not great at it. 
I just like being I like being able to go out in the woods and know that like I'm surrounded by like good things or bad things um I've had to do a lot of hiking and stuff for my degree in the past so yes that's where my weird niche knowledge comes from but you know it slowly fades away as my brain tries to make room for other other niche knowledge (laughs) So, well, Beth, you can just reacquaint yourself with it. You just go to the the cemetery's website, and you can look at all of the beautiful trees. I mean, I do think it's cool that they ha- they tell you, they're like, in Section 20, you'll find these types of trees. So that, like, if you're walking around, it gives you sort of an idea. It is it is quite expansive. Um, it, it covers 733 acres, and only... I've heard conflicting numbers on this. It's 435 to 450 acres are actually landscaped and maintained. Like the rest of it is, it's like woods. It's not maintained. That's, that's actually awesome. That's so good for the environment. Yeah. And so that's for, for future usage, they really planned well on this. So they, they will at some point probably expand into those lands, but they don't need to yet. I actually listened to a podcast. It was uh, the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities podcast. They had an episode about the cemetery, and I got a lot of good information from that. And they actually had a guest on who is a docent at the cemetery. So I, I used her to sort of fact check some of these figures from the information she provided. And she said that they um they have about 350 to 500 years before the cemetery will be full and the reason wow. that's quite a, a 350 to 500 well, is kind of a large know, gap i'm sure like things happen like like covid happened and we had like a mass amount of people dying with that so i'm sure they're like trying to take into account as best they can like what are some life altering mass events that could occur yeah and she also says that it's um it also really heavily relies on current burial trends like people now tend to the trends tend to sway more towards cremation Uh, rather than like a full body internment and embalming and so obviously burying bodies is expensive yeah i mean burying cremains is also very expensive But they, you know, obviously that takes up much less space if you're just interring, you know, like an urn encased in cement in the ground. So, right. So just depending on on how those trends move, they do have uh, quite a long time before they will have to worry about getting more space. That podcast was recorded, I believe, in 2021. And the figure she quoted then is that they have uh, they had 220,000 burials there. And that yearly they averaged around 1,400 to 1,500. So that was, you know, like two years ago. So I've more more than 220,000 now. But since its founding, it has remained a leader in cemetery design and management. So they, the landscape lawn plan concept was actually created in the cemetery. And at the time, it was sort of like whoa that's weird and different we don't know if we like that like this is victorian times cemeteries did not look like this they were not like beautiful parks and so oh so they are the ones that set the trend for cemeteries to be like picnic destinations yeah sort of and so it it has since then become almost universally accepted as the model plan for cemeteries and then it's also studied by horticulturalists from like all over the world and the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce says it's among the city's outstanding attractions and they quoted an artist who once said only a place with a heart and soul can make for its dead a more magnificent park than any which exists for the living look at look at that look at us Cincinnati look at us Ohio I that's kind of nice to be known for some positives yeah (laughs) yeah and so it's it's you know that's a nice sentiment but it's it is also enjoyed by the living i know that there is recently in in like the running world there has been some controversy about whether or not it is okay to go for your runs in cemeteries like half the people kind of fall on one side uh, saying like well it's it's an enclosed place i don't have to worry about getting hit by a car right it's safe 
people are there walking to visit their loved ones why can't I also enjoy it like if I'm being respectful and I'm staying away from funerals I'm not really bothering anyone I'm not leaving garbage like I'm just using the paved walkways or the trails and then the other half is like no it's disrespectful like you should only be there visiting the dead the end I see but that's the thing like back in the day when they made like these nice like cemeteries with like essentially landscaping and parks and stuff like that like like I'm not joking when I say people had picnics there so like how is that how is that any different than someone who's literally passing through the cemetery to go on a jog especially if they're like like these people are picnicking in the grass like you could be picnicking on part of a grave and you don't know right Uh, and it, I mean, there are there are tours given of the graves here. So people are visiting it as a tourist destination, mm-hmm. which is not the intended use of a cemetery. No, so I we, don't see much difference. We visited a cemetery together as uh, tourists and we got to see that was in Dayton. We got to see the Wright brothers and all their like inventors there. And they were like, here's an inventor. There's an inventor. And here's the inventor of the cash register, which is the only one I remember. I don't even remember. I just, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Dayton, you, you got a beautiful cemetery. It was very peaceful. So, um, yeah. So I kind of fall in the camp of like, as long as you're being respectful, like obviously don't go like doing your sprint work next to people who are burying someone they just lost. That's rude. Be respectful. But if you are just minding your own business you're not leaving your trash there you're just doing your runs like that's I feel like that's not that big of a deal and I'm not gonna lie my runner's brain when I saw that they have 42 miles of paved roads there I was like like, wow you could do your full training plan in the cemetery how peaceful yeah you know I I'm sure we could insert like some cemetery joke right now but (laughs) I feel like we should be slightly more respectful (laughs) <laughs> it's listen we have right there I've on been the tip scraping of my I've been scraping the bottle of the barrel well it'll come out <laughs> there is also nearby land that is owned by the cemetery that was originally intended to be a pet cemetery Aww. yeah and so you know like some people were buried with their pets back then but you can't do that now it's, it's not legal so I did not know that and uh Go listen to this podcast. If you're listening to this, go listen to their podcast. I believe it is episode 40 of the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities podcast because Amanda, the docent they talked with, had so much interesting information about this cemetery, but also just about like funerary facts. You know what I'm talking about, stuff with funerals. Um, Because they brought up like the tree pods, which... Is yeah, I, that would be my preferred method. They, to be I just in that. read something that said while they're like they have a design right now, it's not practical. Um, so it's not they can't actually do that to be environmentally friendly. Also, trees take a really long time to grow, and they said that human remains don't have enough nutrition for trees uh, to do that. But you could still like be buried without embalming and that's more environmentally friendly than being embalmed yeah it's just a a matter of legality and where you live which like the tree pods are not legal in ohio as far as i know so but yeah so there's there's a little maybe to be in the future pet cemetery that will be nearby um so uh adolf strock is the landscape architect who designed the cemetery and he um he is the reason that there's like so many stone fountains and lakes and like carvings of angels and all of these green spaces and and all of the different areas of you know trees and shrubs and flowers and so he uh, became internationally recognized for his work at Spring Grove and in 2007 Spring Grove landed a spot on the National Register of Historic Places because of how notable it is there. So they um, have quite a few notable people buried there. I mean, the landscape architect architect Adolf is actually buried there as well. And he has a very simple gravestone. Like, it just says his last name on it, oh. and it's just a flat stone, and that's it. And he, he, uh, he is the reason that, for the most part, the way the cemetery is laid out, families could have, like, one large monument, and then 
the people buried even in that family around it would just have these flat stones okay, so that okay. it wasn't just like huge mausoleums next to huge mausoleums next to a giant obelisk next to like which is all I saw in Louisiana when I was down there. Yeah. Well, it's hard down there, too, because everybody's buried above because yes, of the water yes. table. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there is, like, a quite a wide array of uh, monuments and statues and, and memorials there. But I'm only going to talk about a few of them. One of the most well-known is the Dexter Family Mausoleum, which... Um, <laughs> I'm going to show you a picture of it. It is, people often confuse it. There are three chapels oh. in the cemetery, and people usually think it's one of them because it's so big. Um, so hang on one second. I'm going to pull this up. When I always think of, like, giant mausoleums and stuff, like, when I took a trip down to Louisiana, like, we in New Orleans, we went to, like, I think three different places and you know they ex essentially explained like the reason they are so big down there is because you have like families buried in the same place and that they essentially slow cook them <laughs> inside <laughs> the mausoleums uh, until their like bones remained and then the bones are like buried because bones don't take up a lot of space and then they like get lowered essentially so that like there's space again for like a new family member to like slow cook in the Louisiana heat and humidity. That's not the proper term for it, but that's how it was essentially explained. Yeah. We're, I mean, there's that whole like joke on the internet of like, we're all just soup. Like we're mostly water. We have bits of food in us. We're warm. So it's just the essentially soup yes. when you're alive and your soup when you die. Yes. And world of soup. I just can't imagine it, but I'm like, it's not a terrible idea. Oh <laughs> my god! Right? It's, it's it's like this huge. It's huge. It's got this gothic architecture to it. It's, Th that's just like a mausoleum. It's it's just one family's mausoleum, and it is um when you Google like Spring Grove Cemetery or if you Google like is it haunted like it's one of the main things that comes up so it's a very well known <laughs> spot to visit in the cemetery it's also when I was googling pictures earlier there are so many like senior photos and prom pictures Love taken it. there and like Love wedding it. photos like people get married at the chapel at the front of the cemetery and then go take their wedding photos in the cemetery yeah, it's got the you know structures it's, it's beautiful it is like, beautiful it is however falling apart <laughs> so oh, no. um i'll get into that in just a moment so like a little bit of background around this so so uh it took four years from 1865 to 1869 for the architect James Keyes Wilson to design this Gothic revival combination chapel and mausoleum for the Dexter brothers who I will get more into later, but they were, um, they were a family that like essentially distributed Kentucky whiskey and that's how they made all their money. Gotcha. Okay. So, uh, the chapel is up above, which is why there are stairs. If you look at a picture of it, there are two staircases on the front of it. So, essentially, the mourners would go up the stairs to the chapel, and then the crypts are down below. Okay. And the, as it stands now, it is unfinished. It has never been finished, because oh. originally, there was supposed to be an elevator in the back that would bring the body up for the service, and uh -huh. then take it back down for interment. So, okay. there's just, like, a shaft in the back where an elevator was supposed to go that I don't believe ever got installed. <laughs> Good. So, <Great. laughs> it is also... Uh, because of the material that it is made of, like it's mostly made of sandstone. I knew it. As soon as <laughs> I was like, I bet it's made of sandstone because that is a sedimentary rock and it is not great for Ohio weather. No, it's not. So, um, it's, it's made of sandstone. It's often had like moss or ivy, which also just sort of like degrades Destroys the structural integrity. Yeah. So, um, because of that, it is sort of, as they put it, melting. And it's especially if it's at certain angles, sandstone will do that. It sort of wears away, it kind of melts. And so the crypts are for sure melting, quote unquote. 
And so they ended up having to put these gates up on the front of it to keep people from going up because it's just it's just not safe. Which means that every Joe Schmo's like, there's something terrible happening. Yeah. As soon as you tell people they can't go in somewhere, it's all they want to do. Yes. So they had this this like chapel and these crypts with this cool elevator planned for it planned. And these Dexter brothers also wanted something that was reminiscent of like European chapels. So they were inspired by some of the ones in Paris. And um, this architect was particularly inspired by Chichester Cathedral in England. And it's got these like flying buttresses on the side. And it's considered one of the most beautiful buildings in the Cincinnati area, even though it is melting, as they call it. In 1869, when it was finished, the Dexter Mausoleum had the only flying buttresses in the Cincinnati area. So buttresses are not just a fun word to say. That was like my favorite (laughs) thing in (laughs) elementary school when you studied architecture and like, you know, bridges and things like that. And so the buttresses are basically an addition to architecture. They're really prominent in Gothic architecture right. to help provide like strength to arches and roofs in buildings. And so when they're open, like they are on this mausoleum, they're called flying buttresses. And then when they're like solid, they're just buttresses. So it is it is known for its buttresses. And one more time, I'm just going to say buttresses so (laughs) you feel better i do got it out of your system yeah it actually also had a spire on top at one point but it got struck by lightning oh and so according to that docent that was on the podcast um it's in the lake behind it oh no (laughs) it also had like you know turrets and crockets and pinnacles and those have all kind of just like deteriorated and fallen off which is another reason why it is fenced off and you're not supposed to go near it because things might fall and hit you yeah people never believe that like there's so many things that are like considered abandoned in ohio and they're abandoned because like they're decrepit and stuff and you know things happened and it's like a perfectly reasonable why like reason why you know it's abandoned and then people are like no a ghastly murder happened here and if you go there you're gonna become possessed and it's like no if you go there you could get asbestos you could get hit by a rock it's like just it's not black safe. mold and erosion chad <laughs> chad and brad stop going into these abandoned places you're making everyone else look bad so it actually cost a hundred thousand dollars at that time so back in the 1860s a hundred thousand dollars so that, that was like big bucks even uh, yeah then. yeah um, but obviously well worth it because it is, I mean, it is a focal point. People go there to take pictures of it and look at it. They, because they're all privately owned, these monuments and the cemetery, the, the cemetery does not technically have permission to go in and fix these things unless there are like a few cases where certain families purchased essentially like a caretaking plan a when they bought their, plan. Yeah. It's like now that extended warranty is like paying off so those those monuments and mausoleums do get like power washed every year and maintained but just for safety's sake and because it is like on the edge of a lake the cemetery has had to intervene and sort of do some minor refurbishment and protection to this because it was like sliding down the hill (laughs) and it's the sandstone is eroding so grandpa dexter no Basically, yeah. So the Dexter family, I mentioned before that the families get like the one big monument and then everywhere around there has flat ones. So there is a flat family stone near the monument that reads Charles Dexter, born Carol Dexter Walker, 1906 to 1960. Oh. And this is Carol with two R's and two L's. Okay. Um, so Charles Dexter, a.k.a. Carol Dexter, was the great-grandson of Edmund Dexter Sr., who was the patriarch of this family. And so he was born in England. He moved to Cincinnati in, like, the 1830s. And then when he first came here, he was a grocer. And then he started this liquor distribution company. So they made big bucks until Prohibition, essentially. (laughs) And then probably even after, but secretly. 
secret money. So he died, Edmund died in 1862 at the age of 80, or 80, what am I talking about? At the age of 61. So 1862, he died, he was 61. And he was the first person buried in this mausoleum. When he died, Edmund left behind five sons, three of whom lived in Cincinnati and were like running the business. Um, his son Charles, though originally involved in the business, he sort of had like a, a sickly life and ended up spending most of his time in the library in his Walnut Hills estate. And he died in 1893, leaving his inheritance to his three daughters, Annie, Mary, and Alice. So these are Edmund's granddaughters. Okay. So Alice was the only one of those three girls to get married. Um, Mary died when she was young. And Annie basically lived most of her life in France, refused to speak English, <laughs> and just sort of like kept away from everyone. There's always like one in the family, right? Yeah. There's always just one. Yeah. And so... Uh, Alice got married to a Spanish professor at the University of Cincinnati, and they had one child who was Carol Dexter Walker. And he remained Carol Dexter Walker until Aunt Annie died in 1916. Oh. So when Annie's will was read, there was the following bequest. I give, devise, and bequeath to my nephew, Dexter Walker, the sum of $20,000 to be held for him in trust by my executor, the income therefrom to be paid him quarterly for the use and benefit of my nephew's education until he shall reach the age of 21 years, when said amount shall be paid over to him for his own property, provided he be willing to assume by law the name of Charles Dexter instead of Dexter Walker as he is now known. Oh. So basically, Aunt Annie said, yo, Dex, I will give you $20,000 if you change your name to my dad's name. Aunt Annie, what? <laughs> basically. But at the same time, like, how are you going to refuse $20,000 right. even back then? That's so, like, money, money. Basically, it seems like her thinking is, like, you know, there was just us three girls. Our one sister's already passed away. I didn't have any kids. You are the sole person to carry on, like, my father's name and legacy. Right. But you have a different last name. Gotcha. Yeah, I guess sort of fair, but also pretty eccentric because, like, that's also how, like, families and names work. Yeah. So the stipulation was that he could have this if he changed his name. But if he said, no, I'm not changing my name, then that $20,000 would go to the University of Cincinnati and be used as an endowment fund in Charles's name. Oh. So Alice <laughs> hated this. Her perspective is like, you're just trying to steal my kid. You've been the right. weirdo who didn't talk to us. Right. Lived in France. You didn't have your own kids. And like, you're trying to take this from me. Drama. And then... The this is like the most sisterly thing ever. The next clause after this in Annie's will says, To my sister, Alice Dexter Walker, I leave nothing, for she has never shown me any affection. Damn. Damn. That is uh <laughs> That is like such pettiness that you can only expect from like siblings. I aspire to this level of like f you in the afterlife <laughs> how much i guess i don't know i don't know we don't know them we don't know what their family dynamics like but like i am you know one of many siblings and i can't imagine being this petty with my siblings like i give you nothing because i don't like you <laughs> just like wild wild so obviously Alice like hated this and essentially tried to find any kind of loophole or like way around it and just like say, you know, like, oh, she was she was not like with it enough to like write this like it's illegal. She just tried every tactic she could and none of them went her way. So Carol <laughs> basically took his time because she said he had like right time to do this um he was only 10 when this started oh my god and he turned 21 in 1927 and 
he didn't immediately change his name. So the University of Cincinnati was like, that's our $20,000. <laughs> give it up. So they they essentially won that. But then when it was appealed, the court ruled that she didn't specifically say he had to change his name when he was 21. She just said that at the time of turning 21, he would get that money. Right. If he changed his name. So it was just like. He can't have it before then, but not necessarily you only have until you're 21 to change your name. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. So they, the Ohio Supreme Court was like, whatever, Carol, change your name when you want. Like you got time, go for it. So he was like, okay, I'm going to change my name. Give me my $20,000. And so for the rest of his life, he lived his life as Charles Dexter and his friends called him Dex. And then Annie also in her will made sure to include Spring Grove Cemetery Association. She gave them $5,000 and said that that should be used to maintain the Dexter Mausoleum. So Spring Grove Cemetery actually turned it down. Oh. Seven years after Annie's death, Executor Burton P. Hollister, which sounds like a made up, like what a good character name. Burton P. Hollister at your service. Exactly. He was trying to get Spring Grove to accept the gift and they just kept refusing it, even though he was on the cemetery's board of directors. So he's like, come on, like I got this in for $5,000. It's ours. And they just kept turning it down. I'm not sure why. Uh, yeah, especially it was going to it the care of that very particular mausoleum. Okay. Which whatever. clearly needs it because yes. it's melting. Yes. <laughs> Listen, she saw the future. Annie, maybe that's why she was like away from everyone else because yeah. she just saw things, you know? I don't know. I'm speculating. But she, she tried to help everybody out. In um, a very weird, quirky, petty way. Yeah, well, speaking of petty... In October of 1924, uh, Alice actually tried to get them to just completely demolish the Dexter Mausoleum. And she tried to go through Burton P. Hollister for this. <laughs> wait, wait, what, but why? But why? I, she just wanted, she's like, fine, you know, you want to give money to them. You don't want to give me anything. You're trying to steal my kid. I'm just going to knock it down. I'm the only one alive. So... Another another petty move. Yeah, man, these just talk it out, man. Just talk it out. Well, I guess you can't talk it out to anybody. Everybody's dead. <laughs> Get out the Ouija board and cuss out your sister. Yep. <laughs> so she also um, went to court trying to get that five thousand dollars that Spring Grove turned down. <sighs> Even though she's like from this wealthy family, she has money. <laughs> she doesn't need it. And yeah. then and then insult to injury. Harvard University was actually the next one in line to get the money over her. They're not even anywhere near. <laughs> yeah. That's so Annie's, Annie's will named Harvard the beneficiary of any residue or assets not otherwise specifically bequeathed to an individual or organization. And then Harvard said that the, that $5,000 then became that like unclaimed funds essentially. And Alice claimed that they were returned to the estate. And so then it was hers because she was the only one still alive, even though she's like clearly been disinherited. Yeah. (laughs) And so Harvard ended up actually getting that $5,000. I'm sure they did. (laughs) So Alice actually passed away in uh, 1944 and she left her entire estate to her son. And in her will, like, she clearly was still, like, really upset about this because the way she put it was, throughout this instrument, I have referred to my son by his baptismal name of Carol Dexter Walker, realizing that he assumed by law the name Charles Dexter and is now known as such. I hereby direct that the benefits of his instrument shall inure to my son, whether he be described by his baptismal name of Carol Dexter Walker or by his assumed name of Charles Dexter. She's still real big mad about it. <laughs> big mad. Big mad. Oh. So that is just part of the story tied to the Dexter Chapel mausoleum. There, There's probably a whole lot more. There is some spooky stuff that's tied to it as well. So... There's there's quite a few like haunting stories in the cemetery, but like one of them 
is about the Dexter family crypt. There are some people who are claiming, specifically a pair of young teenage boys, who claim that they had been hanging out with, like, older boys who kind of hazed the younger ones and would, like, dare them to do things. And so they were walking by the cemetery, and one of the older boys dared them to hop the fence and go inside the Dexter mausoleum. Dumb. And so at first, smart, they refused. But you know how it is, like the older boys are going to keep picking on you. Right, and they were like, right. hey, if you do this, like, we'll we'll knock it off. We won't make you do dumb stuff anymore. And so they're like, cool, let's do it. So they, like, made sure no one was watching. They scaled the metal gate around the cemetery. And they went down towards the crypt. And everything was dark and still. And it was, like, a little bit chilly out. And they find the Dexter mausoleum and they're standing outside that like entryway to the crypt down below and neither one of them wanted to go in so it was a lot of like (laughs) you go because like I gotta tie my shoe first and then I'll follow you in it's like oh no 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 actually like I I gotta go like over there and fart and then I'll go (laughs) in like whatever you know it's teenage boys so they're 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 both too scared to go in. They're both kind of pushing the other one to go first. Right. And they hear this growl from the darkness. Oh. And so they're about to book it and take off running. Uh-huh. When out of the mouth of the crypt crept a pair of snarling white dogs. What? Their eyes aglow with blue fire. One of the dogs threw back its ghostly head and let out a blood curdling howl. Okay. And that was it. Like, they took off. Like, pew! You know, like, just the smoke. <laughs> like, a cartoon behind them. But one of them, Smart Thinking, grabbed a pink flower from the tree growing outside the mausoleum walls to prove that they went in. Oh, okay. And so they didn't get hazed anymore by their friends. Dang. So, apparently, people think that these are, like, hellhounds that are guarding the crypt. Interesting. Okay. And there are also other sections of the cemetery that are said to have these white dogs, like white wolves, white dogs, depending on who's telling the story, that just mysteriously show up. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, You know, in like Columbus, there's supposedly like the gates to hell. But like this is the first thing i've heard about like actual hellhounds like hanging out in a cemetery yeah it's in well they're white so like when i think of hellhounds i think of black dogs yeah yeah like isn't there's like a whole there's a song called like black dog about yeah. hellhounds yeah that's like i mean that's like a whole subcategory of like if you see a black dog like it's bad luck and stuff like that and it's like you know Sim- symbolizes like death or aforementioned doom and stuff like that right so i i don't know i mean there's not really any explanation for why they would see these dogs it is gated so i'm not sure that there's a place where it could actually be a dog just in there right but um that is that is one of the ghostly stories of the cemetery uh, another notable memorial is that of Charles Brewer, or as some people know him, C.C. Brewer. I have read on a lot of these like descriptions of who he is and his the ghost story tied with this, that he was an optometrist, and that is not actually true. Okay. He was like a salesman and like a real estate person. Okay. So I don't Weird know. Weird that those two guys. Well, you'll see where like the optometry part comes in okay. in just a second. But I don't know where it like started, but people just keep m- mis, uh, not appropriating, but like misconstruing that and like spreading this misinformation about it. That's fair. So um, he actually has like a pretty tall monument in the cemetery and i want to find a picture of it for you i'm gonna describe it first i think and then (laughs) i will show you the picture because it's very unsettling (laughs) i'm not sure if it's gonna be phallic or if it's gonna be like a spooky statue it it's like a, a well from far away this is it which is like not really phallic it's just kind of there um, but there is a bust of him on the on the side of it. 
And this is what the bus looks like up close. Oh, no. Get, uh, I don't. The eyes. The, okay. Yeah. So I don't want to look at that anymore. He is known you. for the. So you see where the optometrist angle yeah. came in? Yeah. So the urban legend is that he was an optometrist that wanted his eyes put into that bust when he was interred. That's not true. No. They're glass eyes. Oh. Man, do people not understand that eyeballs do like rot? <laughs> I yeah, who knows? But um, they claim that if you were there, the eyes follow like watch you, you. Mm. and um, that this is he wanted his eyes put in it so that he could keep an eye on his okay. like final resting place. Which I will get into this in just a second. He was quite an eccentric person, so that is not the strangest thing. Like, it's not that hard to believe that he would have said something like that. But they are glass eyes. And uh, one man claims <laughs> that he was there um, visiting the cemetery. He looked at the bust and it was like just before nightfall. The cemetery was going to close soon. It closes at like six o'clock. Right. And he was like, well, there's still like a little bit more I want to see. So I'm just going to keep going until somebody like tells me I have to get out. Buddy, this is how all bad like horror stories yeah. start. Well, and then also he says he was whistling in a graveyard, which is also a song that you're not supposed to do. My dude, what are you doing? That's so he's no. Just having a grand old time strolling through the cemetery. Nonchalantly. Whistling like, I don't know, turkey in the straw or something. <laughs> Straw. I don't know. That's the only thing I can, or like Dixie. Like those are the two things I can think of that people whistle because I can't imagine that he was whistling like, I don't know, like Amazing Grace or something like, or like We Are Never Getting Back Together it, by Taylor yeah, Swift or yeah. something. So he was walking along and he stopped in front of the tall white grave marker, bearing the eerie yellow eyes of Charles Brewer. The man claims that the eyes seem to be watching him, but even creepier, they seem to recognize him as an intruder. Refusing to let Charles impede him on his forbidden tour of the grounds, the man turned to leave when suddenly, and he swears by this, one of the eyes popped out of Charles's <laughs> head and landed on the ground beside his foot. The eye then turned itself all the way around to gawk up at the man. What? squelching wetly <laughs> as oh. it moved like i can hear it in <laughs> yes, my brain yes so feeling um a little too seen the man decided to cut his tour short right then and there he claims to have returned to spring grove the next day to see if his eyes had deceived him only to find the eye back in its place and he didn't know if he imagined the whole thing or what but according to him, on closer inspection, the man could just barely make out the faint glistening trail of goo where the eye had landed. Stop, you stop that. Like a snail trail or ectoplasmic X marks the spot. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, first of all, should he have been like cutting it that close, whistling, being, you know, I mean, probably not. I used to, growing up, there is a pretty large cemetery downtown in the city where Beth and I grew up. And uh, one of my friends lived on the edge of the cemetery. So at night we would jump the fence in her backyard and go play hide and seek right. in but that cemetery. You're also a so child. Different, different, different intentions. Would I still do it today? Probably. <laughs> but also. <laughs> would you be whistling? I would not. Okay. Uh, there, squelching a is a good use of that word like what a good like automatopoeia type yeah. word where, where it's like oh yeah i know exactly what that sounds like that's i have a, a a big bone to pick with like closed captioning on most things and subtitling but netflix is really stepping up its game i don't know who does the the subtitling on that but whoever does it for stranger things should do it for everything because they use like wet squelching to describe so many things and you're like okay i know what that and that is 100 like. percent like on brand for stranger things they also yep. would put like suspenseful stinger for like a guitar sound <laughs> and i was like that is this is good keep doing this whoever you are you're doing an excellent job pat on your back so I mentioned that Charles Brewer is kind of an eccentric person. So he apparently 
like he disowned his kids he was like ego boost enough that he made this bronze bust of himself with creepy eyeballs yep. on his memorial he was a salesman a commission agent and a real estate investor he got married three different times he disowned his daughters and tried to blow up one of his own buildings <laughs> he inevitably was declared insane and died in a mental facility well, that's um, sad. That is sad. But before he died, he mailed his own suicide letter to the newspaper. What? So this is in, um, it looks like an archive of oh, some, uh, one of the newspapers from Cincinnati um, dated January 17th. And I, I think 1908, this like. It says ten oh eight, which is drastically like back in yeah in the olden days. So that's not correct, but um, he he wrote this letter. He sent it to the newspaper, and it says, uh, "Doctor Otis Cameron, Coroner, dear sir, my tune is Charles C. Brewer. I live at four forty three Ludlow Avenue. My health is good, except that I have a rupture and muscular rheumatism." I have seven children living. Some of them are spoiled and suing me for all I have for maintenance. <laughs> I have married three times. The last is living with me now, but she knows nothing of what I am doing. I provided for her by last will and testament, December A.D. 1908. I am tired of living under our government. Consolidation means ruination. I therefore end my life tonight without the knowledge of anybody. Your friend, and I don't know if this is like just a mistype, or if they can't read what it is, it's it's unpronounceable to me. But it's how he signed it. And okay. then it, Crosley Rogers, his attorney, also received a letter from Brewer this like the same day around noon. I love that he was like, unbeknown to anybody else, I'm going to send this to you via newspaper so yeah. everybody will know. I'm going to do it and no one knows, but I sent 14 letters and a carrier pigeon. It was in the newspaper and then his... A, his attorney was just like, ah, this seems serious. So he went over to the Brewer residence and he said um, while he was employed by Mr. Brewer, he couldn't disclose the contents of the letter or what transpired at the Brewer residence yesterday afternoon. Brewer has been the defendant or the plaintiff in numerous lawsuits in the pl- past few years. So he's basically like claiming attorney client privilege right, for this person right. who might be dead. He has employed many attorneys, but whenever he had any correspondence with them, he had his wife write the letter on a typewriter and then signed it. The letter received by the coroner was all in the same handwriting. It would require an expert penman to forge the signature of Brewer. He writes in a trembling hand, and the letters are all original. So Coroner Cameron yesterday compared the suicide letter with the signature on and that Brewer says is his, mm-hmm. and several witnesses said that they like they're like yep that's his signature and so the coroner was like "Mm, maybe the police should go to his house and see what's going on so the police went to his house and he was just perfectly fine and just walking around like nothing happened oh buddy was that for attention it was like for attention a little bit right? i don't know but he the coroner after that was like well you know like two years ago he did buy two really expensive coffins for himself and his wife and he just keeps them in like a room at his house so i don't know if he's serious about this <laughs> or what so he was a pretty eccentric guy yeah, yeah. Um, very got... sad ending to his life clearly had some mental health issues that were not being addressed properly or helped but what a wild story <laughs> quite a bit of that information actually came from greg hand he's a local historian in cincinnati and he has a tumblr post his handle is hando hand e-a-u-x and he has a post um, titled 15 Curious Facts About Cincinnati Spring Grove Cemetery. And he addresses some of the more popular rumors. Um, the very first one he hits on is that many people think that George Reeves. Do you know who that is? I don't. He know was the original is. Superman. Oh. Um, he actually, uh, it's like a little bit of a mystery. Some people think that he shot himself. Some people think that he was shot and it was made to look like a suicide okay there was like a weird ben affleck movie made about it years ago but he he was on 
the Superman TV show in the 50s. Okay. And people say that he's buried in Spring Grove. That's not true. He's buried in California. That makes sense. But where where this confusion starts is that he um he he was married, but his mother wanted him like interred in a mausoleum in Cincinnati. Okay. He was actually going to be buried in I believe it's like the Robinson Mausoleum. They were a uh, they were one of the first traveling circuses in the U.S., and so they have a big mausoleum in Cincinnati, and so they were going to put him in there. Okay. The problem is it was winter, and they couldn't bury anybody. Right. So George's body just kind of, like, sat in one of the chapels at Spring Grove oh. over the winter. By the time it was like, okay, it's going to be, like, the spring thaw. Like, maybe we can finally inter him. They realized there wasn't enough room in that mausoleum. Yikes. So I I believe they cremated him mm-hmm. and then they sent him to California where he's now buried. Okay. Um they there's also like quite a few fraternities that like force their pledges to break into the cemetery. Um Surprise. I, surprise. Yeah. Isaac M. Jordan actually died in 1890 by falling down an open elevator shaft at the Lincoln Inn Court on Main Street in Cincinnati. Okay. He was a businessman and politician, but he helped create the Sigma Chi fraternity. And so well into the 70s even, Sigma Chi pledges were ordered to sneak in, record the inscription on his tomb, and then come back by dawn. The Norman Chapel, which is in the very front of the cemetery, has a jail in the basement. <laughs> so the jail was built in 1880, and it it was basically just, like, to jail people overnight for driving too quickly through the cemetery. That's wild. Which is really funny because... A lot of those would have been horse-drawn carriages. Yeah. How fast are you driving? So it's like, well, I hope you're not, like, racing home for anything. You gotta go slowly through the cemetery. How spooky would that be, too, to be, like, you're below, right? You're below a crypt at that point. Yeah, like, you're below a chapel nope. in a cemetery in the speeding jail overnight. <laughs> and there were, like, night watchmen that were deputized by the county sheriff to enforce the law. That's so funny. And they say that those that that jail area is haunted. It's today used for storage. Okay. So there's not a lot of people who go down there, but there were quite a few people who said that they would hear like moaning down there. They uh there's another person who uh was meant to be buried in the cemetery, um, George K. Schoenberger built a uh, scarlet scarlet oaks mansion in clifton for his wife sarah hamilton schoenberger in 1867 she passed away in 1881 and so he had this huge vault constructed for her he ended up getting remarried two years later though to um a young canadian woman named ella Beatty. but he still missed sarah he like loved her she was the love of mm-hmm. his life and he would climb up on the turrets of his mansion and uh. use a telescope to stare at their tomb and that's just like think about his dead wife. That's kind of that's kind of nice. It's kind of sweet until it's, you realize that like his wife is just like George, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, nothing, just staring at Sarah's grave. It's very uh, it's got a little like Edgar Allan. Alan Poe, like type of like dark romanticism of like yeah, Annabelle, I miss you, and you're like, dude, it's your cousin, chill out. Yeah, very. Not that they're cousins, but apparently, just chill out. Apparently, like it got to the point where one day Ella it was just like enough's enough, and she just locked him up there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and when he died in 1892, he and Sarah were reunited. He was buried in the vault, and then Ella married a Canadian composer. She just dipped. I do you blame her? No, good for her. Yeah, there were quite a few bodies that were buried in other graveyards that have been relocated so they say perhaps a thousand or more spring grove residents died years even decades before the cemetery was opened in 1845 because they were they were moved after the new area was purchased and 
a lot of those people were victims of the cholera epidemics that we talked about. And huh, so they actually got a proper burial. Mm. Yes, I'm quite sure they did not move them in barrels. <laughs> and then the last thing I'll touch on is that the <laughs> they've always sort of had a controversial headstone issue there. This is one of them. <laughs> There's oh. a, a sphinx on top of it. Okay. Um, David B. Lawler, who was one of the founders of Spring Grove, he wanted to put a sphinx on his plot. And some of the directors considered this a heathen symbol. A and heathen symbol. I mean, it is culturally appropriative, but this was also the 1800s. Correct. They sort of like argued against it, but it was eventually allowed. And then 10 years later, Alexander Lada, inventor of the fire engine, had a headstone design with a, a fire engine on top. And they said that was too commercial and they wouldn't allow it. <laughs> I'm sorry you invented this like life saving thing, but yeah, it's too commercial. It's too commercial. You it can't doesn't have fit it. Our, our aesthetic of like gothic architecture and yeah. our hundreds of trees. Yeah. Um, and then there are actually um, two stones with SpongeBob on them. Oh. Now, uh, it's SpongeBob wearing military uniforms. There's only one person buried there, but the the plots and the stones were purchased for twin sisters. And this was in like 2014 that this controversy came up. They put them up and then almost immediately the cemetery said that the statues didn't meet the standards of it and took them down. Which man, they're like, grieving. Yeah. How are you about to tell them like you can't have those headstones that you paid thousands of dollars for? They don't fit the aesthetic. Right. And so they they like went to court essentially and the cemetery ended up relenting and saying it was okay, they could put them back and they apologized. There was a statement released to the news that said Spring Grove Cemetery apologizes to the Walker family. Our personnel oversaw the design and installed the SpongeBob monuments and then had them removed when concerns were raised by others. We deeply regret the distress this caused the family. We've worked hard to remedy the problem and appreciate the cooperation we received from the family during this process. So they reinstalled them Friday. Full granite slabs were erected behind it to wow. like shield it from like, passersby so it was originally just the two spongebobs and now there's these like stones behind it so okay. well, i guess it's not as obvious that no, they're there when you're walking by probably be helpful for like weathering too granite can handle some ohio weather yeah Stand, sandstone on the other hand not so much exactly the walkers said the peace the family can now enjoy at Kimberly's gravesite on the beautiful grounds of the historic Spring Grove Cemetery will help them find the strength to endure the upcoming trial of the man accused in her death. So oh. this is why this is like especially heinous is that on Valentine's Day in 2013, police in Colorado Springs found Sergeant Kimberly Walker dead in her hotel room. Her boyfriend, also a soldier, was later charged and arrested Holy cow. for her murder. So, like, their poor daughter was yeah. murdered by her boyfriend. They wanted this SpongeBob memorial for right. her because it was her favorite show. Right. It's dressed in military fatigues because she's in the army, and I believe her twin sister, Kara, is in the Navy. Okay. And so this is where they're supposed to be laid to rest. So yeah. it was, like, this nice memorial for their daughter. Right. And then the cemetery says, no, it's too tacky, and gets rid of it. God. Like. Well, Awful. I guess they I guess they did try to make up for it. They which did. Is, which is nice. Yeah. And I I kind of understand, like, there are some other people who own plots there that are now like, this is too much of a tourist thing. I don't want to end up on a tour. Don't bury me there. Right. So I, I, I guess, I don't know. We all have different views of death, and it probably doesn't help that just culturally... We don't talk about death a lot, and we also don't talk about, like, cemeteries and stuff, and I feel like those were probably more talked about in the 1800s and stuff, and, like, it wasn't, you know, if I said, hey, Britta, you want to go to a cemetery and have a picnic? People would be like, that's kind of weird, Beth. Why are you doing that? Whereas, like, if this was, you know, in the 1800s or even the early 1900s, they'd be like, oh, yes, that sounds like a jolly good time. A jolly good time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 
you know, I think cemeteries are beautiful and I think they're peaceful and I don't mind visiting them. However, I have a hard time visiting my loved ones in cemeteries because I don't like to think about them like that. I like to remember what they were like when they were alive. And I just want to be like thrown in a hole in the middle of the woods so that after I decay, Boy Scouts can find my skull years later and have a cool story. (laughs) We'll get you out by the barrel full. (laughs) Don't put me in a barrel. Get a Louis Vuitton suitcase and put me in that. (laughs) And not Uh, the knockoff ones. A real one. Legit. Legit. Or else you'll haunt the woods. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to haunt the woods no matter what. All right, that's fair enough. Okay. So, Cincinnati, you got some spooks and uh, some ghosts and some other chilly, chilling and spine tingling things happening. And chili. And chili. On your spaghetti. On your spaghetti. It's delicious. I have a different opinion on that. We are two different Ohioans over here. <laughs> Well, that uh, that concludes this episode. I suppose we didn't um, discuss any kind of uh, like sign off or anything like that. So I guess we will just um, say that we will cite our sources on our uh, our comments here on on this episode when it airs, and um, you can find us on Instagram at. It's uh, at Lake Erie Library on Instagram. You can follow us there. We'll post photos and updates for upcoming episodes. We should thank our wealthy benefactor. Yes, our wealthy benefactor. I would like to deeply thank for uh, equipping us with the necessary tools for this wonderful podcast. So many barrels. (laughs) We're surrounded. Um, we are actually recording this in a barrel. This has been one giant advertisement for barrels. <laughs> Do you often wonder where you're going to store things? Did you think you'd make it through a whole podcast episode without an ad interrupting you? Joke's on you. <laughs> barrels. Barrels of fun. Buy them at a store near you. So stay spooky, friends, and uh, we'll catch you next time here at the Lake Erie Library. Bye.